It's Let's ride. Time for the words that are recited before each and every game here at Dodger Stadium. Take it away, Finn. It's time for Dodger Baseball. What's going on, Dodgers fans? Hope you're doing well out there. Your Los Angeles Dodgers are National League West champions once again. Their ninth crown in the last 10 years. 2021, obviously they didn't win, but they still beat the Giants, so we'll take that. Did it in great fashion. They beat the Arizona Diamondbacks on Tuesday evening. We are now recording live after the game that went to extra innings against the Arizona Diamondbacks. So even though the Dodgers took the series, they fall short. Wednesday evening, losing in walk-off fashion, 5-3. Sergio Alcantara, 217 hitter, four home runs, waiver claim from the San Diego Padres, came through in the nine hole with two outs, hitting a three-run walk-off home run against Craig Kimbrell. I uh, wasn't really hoping to go the, the whole Kimbrell route tonight, but I guess we can start with that. Um, my quick thoughts are, even though Let It Go Craig was riding for a while, he, he went back to his old Guns N' Roses tendencies, and I'm not too happy with what I saw. So there are some concerns, and he's not my postseason closer. I'm sorry if you have faith in him. I cannot trust him. He's been a liability all season, and this is just another reiteration of why Craig Kimbrell is a liability. With that being said, let me pass it over to David Rosenthal. How's it going, David? Welcome back. You can either talk about the Dodgers being National League West champions once again, or you can talk about this game or anything else Dodgers-related. Yeah, so the Dodgers have been National League West champions for a couple months now in my mind. So I, I didn't view this as a big deal yesterday. Obviously, it's nice, nine out of the uh, last 10 years, with the only year being a Giants complete slumdog millionaire flu city last year. Uh, Kimbrell, I didn't love that they threw him out there tonight off of back-to-back after a big celebration. Uh, prior to tonight in September, he had faced 15 batters and retired all of them. So I, you know, I think the kid from Arizona made a nice swing and, and it happened to go out of the ballpark. So I'm not shutting the door on closer Kimbrell yet. Uh, I think he's got about two and a half, three weeks to really solidify his role. Uh, he's for sure going to be on the roster. Uh, I think we can pretty much guarantee that at this point, especially factoring in a couple injuries. Uh, I still, <laughs> I still kind of believe in it. Uh, he's shown me enough this year where I'm comfortable with him going out there. I mean, it depends on the situation, but if you get Phillips, uh, Trinan hopefully is going to come back shortly. If he can prove that he can be consistent and healthy, then he's he's pretty much your guy. But I, for now, it's still a wait and see for Kimbrell for me. Which is kind of sad, given that we're almost through the season now, and we still don't know if our closer is technically the closer. But on a more uh, softer note here, after 141 games – Freddie Freeman finally got a day off, even though he sent apparently six text messages to Dave Roberts, hounding him to put him back in the lineup. But with a 329 batting average, I believe that is best in the National League for the batting title, 20 home runs, 91 RBIs, and 929 on base plus slugging. In his first year in Dodger Blue, he has been everything you could ask for and more, an MVP candidate. So I'm loving what we got out of Freddie Freeman. Uh, Jake Reiner, how's it going? It's going great. This is terrific. I think this was the most uh, business-like season for the Dodgers. There were a few weeks or maybe even a month in there at the beginning that was a little rocky. Obviously, we saw huge slumps from uh, Muncie, Bellinger, and Turner um, for a good chunk of the season and Muncie and Turner have certainly turned it around Bellinger kind of not so much. Um, he's had a few moments here and there, but overall the team has just been electric and they've dealt with every single injury they've lost. They lost their ACE and Walker Bueller and still had the best pitching staff in all of baseball. So, um, this, this team is, is, is an unbelievable, uh, juggernaut. 
And it's just, it's just been a joy to watch them this year. And one thing that, you know, I, I have to keep reminding myself is that obviously as Dodgers fans, we want to win the world series. It's kind of world series or bust every single year now. But um, if we don't take time to appreciate this season, then, you know, what is the point of being a fan? I mean, I think we have to take a moment to really appreciate what this team has done uh, for uh, the full season up until this point. Um, So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I'm a little bit surprised at how attached David is to Craig Kimbrell because it's very reminiscent of, uh, Dave Roberts, uh, emotional connection to Kenley Jansen all those years. It just, it just doesn't make very much sense when, um, that particular pitcher just hasn't really proven that he is the guy. And I agree with Kevin. I mean, if he hasn't proved it by now, you know, what, what is a couple weeks going to, is that going to make any difference? I mean, he could either go one of two ways, right? He can either be an absolute disaster from here on out, or he can go on another little run like he just did with, you know, nine uh, scoreless outings in a row up until this point. So um, it is a crap shoot. Whereas, you know, what you're going to get from Evan Phillips, you just know what you're going to get from him. You know what you're going to get from a guy like Blake Trinan and, and Alex Vessia too, under the radar has been absolutely dealing and dominant on the mound. Like, there are other pitchers on this roster, Chris Martin, another one, that you can trust in high leverage to close out a game more than you can trust Craig Kimball at this point. But, you know, having said all of that, he, Craig Kimball is really the only, you know, quote unquote, weak link on this team. The rest of it is 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 unbelievable. Um, the one thing, though, that has been the Achilles heel of the Dodgers these past few postseasons, um, excluding 2020, has been running into good pitching. And we know that they're going to run into good pitching in the postseason. It's inevitable. That's why all the teams that get into the postseason are good is because of their pitching. So we're going to face a couple of tough arms in the playoffs. And that's what I'm a little worried about just in terms of offensive production. But I think the Dodgers have by far and away the best pitching staff in all of baseball. And that is what wins championships. So um, even if the Dodgers aren't able to put up crooked numbers in the postseason, I still have confidence in this team. That was only the third home run he's given up all year for the record. Well, that's because he's been wild all year and doesn't put the ball in the zone. And and, and that pitch that he gave a, 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 up a home run off of was actually, you know, not a bad pitch that he made. The guy just went up and, and got it. But Prior to that, two batters before that, he comes out of the bullpen and walks the leadoff batter. I mean, that just cannot happen. It just can't happen in the, in the playoffs. It can't happen in high leverage like that. So that worries me against a, a mediocre Diamondbacks team. So you brought up a, a, a batter I wanted to highlight, and I'm about to take my massive L because I've been one of his biggest supporters and truthers ever since his first at bat with the Dodgers. And then I just went WWE heel for some reason and turned against this, turned against this guy. But I'm referring to Justin Turner because I fed him to the dogs the first two and a half, three months. Yeah, of the you season. did. But he has really turned it on. He's up to a 276 batting average, 13 home runs, 78 runs batted in. In the second half since the All-Star break, he's batting 330 with a 962 OPS. He looks like the Justin Turner of all the other years. And I think I compared his batting average when I was doing some research to, I think, 2019, maybe 2018. It's basically in the same zone. Maybe he doesn't have as many home runs, but the the near OPS now of 797, we're basically back to what Justin Turner has been historically for the Dodgers. Yeah, I mean, I, I was saying it from the beginning of the season. You know, this guy is a quote unquote professional hitter and just give him time because he's been that guy year in and year out. And maybe he's lost, uh, you know, a few steps. I mean, he is what, 38, uh, 37, 38 at this point. So, you know, you got to cut him some slack there, but I never wavered on, on how I felt about him. And I knew that, you know, this Dodgers team was good enough to hold the fort while he kind of figured things out. Same thing with Max Muncie, you know, Max Muncie has been on a tear recently and, and the power is back too from him, which is great to see, but Justin Turner, just a consistent model of consistency. And he's 
one of the all-time Dodger greats. Yeah, Muncy's back up to a 200 batting average. The Mendoza line, 20 home runs, four home runs in his last six games, I believe. And, and over his last seven games, like a 1,400 OPS. Did not write him off, thankfully, because I always kind of had a feeling once he got healthy, he would turn it on. And I feel like I'd rather have a hot Muncy at this point in the season than back in April and May. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of said on this this podcast at some point, I said Justin Turner is going to end up around 260, 265 batting average. And he's actually exceeding what I what I thought he was going to do after that slow start. So, look, I, I think JT's got a little bit left in the tank, but I also think this might be it for him, uh, whether it's as a Dodger or uh, in Major League Baseball entirely. Like Jake said, he's either 37, 38. I think he's 38. Uh, but... I mean, he's playing like he can go another year or two. So I'm kind of up in the air. If, if I mean, this is a conversation for the off season, but you got guys in the in the minor leagues who can come up play third base. Vargas is right there, but I'm just hoping he can get one more play, one more vintage Justin Turner postseason run in him, and then I'll be content either way. Yeah, I agree. He was not like himself during the Braves, and he got hurt in the 2021 NLCS. So yeah, be great redemption opportunity tommy canely was activated off the il pitched an inning in this most recent looked game great he did look great two strikeouts reached 97 miles per hour was relying a lot on his changeup, so that's a great addition heath hembry was designated for assignment a dodgers pitcher that we won't remember because he just wasn't very good but that'll be his legacy um trinan back on the il but a lot of differing reports one minute he's in pain and he might not come back then there's a lot of optimism saying he might come back uh beginning of october in time for the postseason just a major wild card at this point so i don't know what we can do and expect from blake trinan but obviously the daughters need his presence but if they can't get him back at least bruce star gradual yancy almonte are throwing bullpens and should be activated soon and then tony gonsolin another wild card a lot of differing reports there as well uh they think he'll pitch for the playoffs, but then in the most recent interview with Dave Roberts earlier in the game today, possible bullpen arm, which I don't really like the idea of that. We'll get into the Dodgers postseason rotation in just a second, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. He's going to be able to get activated in 10 days. I'll say maybe he gets two starts in before the season ends. And if he can't go in the NLDS, I think they'll be able to get something out of him in the NLCS. I frankly don't, I don't think that's enough time. Uh, I, I just don't, I don't think you can chance it uh, with Gonsolin as a starter. If he only gets one or two starts in the regular season. I mean, if you're, if you're willing to speed up the ramp up, you, you know, you go 70 pitches right away and then a hundred for the second start, then maybe. But if you're just going 50 to 70 pitches, I don't know if that's enough. Yes, you can throw them out there. Only have them go five innings max. Use some of these starters you have out of the bullpen. But again, like I said, if you're going to use some of these guys out of the bullpen, you better start getting them used to it now. You better give them at least one or two appearances in the regular season to get their routine in and have it be familiarized with them. Regardless if they've done it in the past, it's, it's important for pitchers to get some kind of a routine so they're not you know, thrown to the wolves like uh, Dustin May and Gonsolin were in 2020. Yeah, I mean, you know, they keep talking about the possibility of uh, Haney coming out of the pen. I agree with you. I think they should stick him in there and just see how he does, you know, get that routine down. We've seen Gonsolin come out of the bullpen. It's not been pretty. So I, I don't like that, the thought of that either. If they can ramp him up for a start to be a starter, that's what they should only be focusing on. I feel like Heaney has a lot of experience coming out of the pen in the past. So I don't think they need to throw him in that role right now in the regular I, season. And at the same time, I kind of like that. The what Dodgers experience are he's been, this is the, this is the only season he's been actually good. So I, I don't he's trust seven, that seven, he's had... eight year veteran. He's come out of the bullpen in the past, not in the postseason, but this is the regular season against bad teams. So what difference is it going to make right now? Anyways. Because it's about routine. It's about creature that they're, they're creatures of habit. If you're going to, if you're going to bring him out of the bullpen, you might as well get that routine going. Cause it's a different routine getting ready and hot when you need to at a moment's notice. 
So since 2014, Andrew Heaney has come out of the bullpen nine times in his career. It's enough for me. Um, and like I was but, trying to but, get but, to, what? I like that the Dodgers are using six guys as starters right now, or is it five and Grove is the six guy, but regardless, you got to keep the arms fresh and that's a priority than getting someone bullpen experience right now. I, I agree with that. I like the six man, six man rotation, keeping these guys fresh, keeping them around 80 pitches for at least one more turn of the rotation before you can ramp them up again. But my, but before we move on, I hate kind of hate the idea of Andrew Heaney out of the bullpen. I mean, that dude has given up home runs left and right. And if you're going to give up a lot of home runs, it's better if you're a starter because you have five or six innings to kind of work around that. If you're coming in out of the bullpen, you give up a home run in the seventh inning, you know, for your one inning, you, you failed, you blew it. You know, it's over. I, I, I don't see them bringing him in, in the seventh inning. I mean, you've got Ferguson, you've got Vessia. Those are your high leverage lefties. Well, I think they're the going to bring him they in. Use him. They, you, you bring him in. Let's say Dustin May starts a game. He starts off rocky. You know, he's 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 got a high pitch count or whatever, and you're down three nothing in the fourth no, inning. He's you bring a long in Haney. man, right? He's the long man. He's long not man. he's not coming. I don't think he's coming in to get you know you know Matt Olson or whatever. I mean, he's not coming in to get those big hitters. You're you're going to go to Vessi and you're going to go to Ferguson in those in those situations. Okay, wouldn't yeah, rule out Heaney. Wouldn't rule out a three inning save from Heaney if he's dealing though. <laughs> Oh my God. Also, no, he's not. He's not the guy for that. He's not. You guys are riding off Heaney but yard right now. Heaney was absolutely fine against the Padres. He pitched great against the Mets he, against pretty much every team. He's been fine. He had one bad start where he gave up five runs. Um, I can't remember the opponent. Was it, it was San Francisco. I think it was a hot day regardless, but he has an ERA under three. I don't, I don't, let's get into who we think the Dodgers postseason rotation is going to be because that's a question well, he's from up 12 home runs and 12 starts. So it's not really the guy I want closing a game at all. So one a game, that's, that's not that bad, but if you're a reliever, it is that's okay. catastrophic. If you're a reliever, I'll get back to that in a second. Cause I want to stay on topic here. Catchy name guy. Who are the Dodgers playoff starters? Richard Aller two asking if Tyler Anderson, Tyler Anderson should be one of those starters. So, all right, give me your four starters. Uh, Julio Arias game one. Um, I would go Kershaw game two. And then, you know, you could, you could go may, but you could also go Tyler Anderson. You're not keeping Tyler Anderson out of this rotation. You're just not. He is. Well, I'm. I'm. I'm not keeping him out. I'm saying, is he? Is he going game three or game four? He's right? going like, for that's me. What I'm he's, he's for me. He's going game two. Kershaw's no, going to go game three. No, absolutely not. My playoff rotation is three lefties in a row, and then Dustin May. It's going to be Arias, Anderson, and Kershaw and May on the road. There, Dustin May right now has no business starting a postseason game. In his last two starts against the Padres, he has had no control. He's not attacking the strike zone whatsoever. He's given up nine runs over 10 innings, uh, eight strikeouts, eight walks. He got he gave up absolute hangers to Manny Machado and Brandon Drury. Then in the second outing, he wasn't so sharp. He threw up routine ball that should have been to first, completely over uh, Freeman's head. Listen, he's only faced the Marlins too. How can you say Dustin May at this point is your guy? Because we know who Dustin May is. This yeah. is not who Dustin May is. And this is a guy that, can't, that hasn't pitched in over a year. Like, Yeah, you so know, why do you want that in the postseason? He's still got because by the time the postseason, left. By the time the postseason starts, he's going to be ready. Guaranteed. I completely out, agree. Out of and the bullpen. He, look, it's going to be, if Heaney's on the roster, he is your insurance policy, policy if Dustin May goes wrong. They're going to give the ball to Dustin May. That guy is too good to not give him the ball. And if, if it goes poorly in the first, second, third inning, then you can bring in Heaney for, to finish off the start. That's how it's there going There is no was, world where Dustin May is starting over Tony Gonsolin. I'm sorry. I don't think Tony Gon- I frankly, I'm if not Tony sure Tony Gonsolin is not, not healthy, ready. Dustin May isn't exactly healthy himself. You guys are acting like he is the same Dustin May prior he's to the healthy. Tommy John he's just, surgery. He's just rusty. There's no mechanics in his stuff whatsoever. He has not proven in his four starts yet that he is capable of starting a postseason game. 
what they can do with him right now is bring him out of the bullpen for two, three innings, because at least then you don't have to worry about his pitch count and he can completely unload it. Tyler Anderson, who has been way better than Dustin May all season with a 265 year you have to have him in there. Well, he's Kersh- in there regardless. Kershaw Here, he's in game. there for all of he's he's Kershaw it, nobody's is your game two starter. That. There is no disputing that he's been better than just about anyone when healthy with the exception of Urias. And I don't see Tony Gonsolin being left off. I think he's going to be healthy. If he's healthy, then you might be right. But right now, he's not healthy. He's throwing bullpens. I think he's going to be he's been he's throwing not. bullpens for two months. We haven't seen him since He's August. not on the mound yet. He's not, a, he's not on the mound in a real game yet. So he's not healthy right now. Andrew Heaney will be starting over Dustin May if the season started tomorrow. The postseason tomorrow, tomorrow, sure. But in two weeks, when Dustin May gets a couple more starts, no, you're you're going to be wrong on that one. I'm He's just too going good. Off, I'm going off what I'm seeing right now. Guys that come off Tommy John surgery are never themselves right away. I don't think there's enough time. He didn't have a full spring training. He is basically relying on his heater right now because he has no command of the secondary pitches whatsoever. I just don't know what you guys are going off of unless you're living in the past. And even in the previous postseasons, Dustin May wasn't exactly electric either. I'm going off that Dustin May is arguably has the best stuff in major league baseball. That is not a guy you don't give the ball to. It's just not. Now, do you have backup plans? Do you have a quick hook? Absolutely. But for the postseason, you want that guy pitching for you. He's got th- at least three more starts to figure his shit out which he has said he's it's it's despite the second to last start, this most recent start was slightly better. As long as he can keep going with an upward trajectory and keep staying healthy, each start for him is going to get more. He's going to get more and more comfortable. I agree. He'll be pitching in the postseason, but right now he's more valuable coming out of the pen. And like you just said, why would I want to start a guy with a short leash? The last thing I want to do is rely on Dave Roberts in bullpen management Give me the guys that I know are going to go five to six innings for sure. Well, and less in the less in the brain of Roberts because that's where things go wrong. Okay, but if you start Heaney, he's another guy who's going to be on an extremely short leash. It's it's the same type of pitcher right now. Dustin May in the future is going to win a Cy Young, but Dustin May right now has a short leash from what we've seen. And Andrew Heaney is the same way. They've they've had Heaney on a short leash all year. He can't keep the ball in the ballpark right now. So either way, you're going to have a guy with a short leash, and you're going to bring in the other one to clean up the other one's mess. And also, you guys, you guys you're gonna speak, have it. You're you speak down of Heaney like he's been some gas can. He's got a two ninety, a two eighty four year. Excuse me. Don't 80, trust him. Never have. Never strikeouts. will. Strikeouts. I know because you're biased. Eighty four strikeouts. I'm not bi- oh. what, biased. about what? You have been saying ever since they signed him, he is gonna fail, and so far he has proven all the skeptics wrong. Eighty four strikeouts over. Ben is pl- been a pleasant surprise. A one oh seven surprise. That'll don't, play. Don't care. Don't trust him. Don't trust him. Never been in a postseason. Uh, never been in a postseason and- game. He gives up home runs like it's going out of style. Don't trust him. That's that, why I don't I don't I don't I don't trust Craig Kimbrell either. That is why I said Tyler Anderson is my game two starter. It's not because I don't trust him. I just want Tyler Anderson for the first series to pitch at home. Clayton Kershaw, as Chris Camello, friend of the show, likes to say, is an October war horse. He can go on the road and pitch like it's nobody's business. I trust Kershaw on the road or at home. I want Anderson to get his first start in the postseason at home, guaranteed. And he's been so lights out this year. He has been cool under pressure. He has earned that. But if the Dodgers go down 0-1, you really want to go with Anderson in game two? 100%. I trust Tyler Anderson with my life right now. Game seven in the World Series, I would be more than comfortable sending Tyler Anderson out there oh right now. How can you not? How can you watch him pitch right now and not be confident in him? Because I'm going with He's been Urias. amazing. Going He's had Urias. one you have more. You have more confidence. You have more confidence in Andrew Haney than Tyler Anderson. Is that what I'm hearing, Kevin? No, no. you're just hearing no things. Way. I said Andrew Heaney over Dustin May, and I I don't know if there's been one start, maybe when he first came back off the aisle, where he's gone less than five innings. In that it's, day and age, I don't age, care about you're, in you're that era. I don't five that innings is the new innings. quality start. Five innings is the new quality start. I don't care if you're going five innings if you're automatically giving up a one or two home runs a start. You know, you can't do but that in the playoffs. Been solo in the playoffs, home runs. He's in not the playoffs, walking players. home runs win baseball games. So do strikeouts. You got to have the ability to strike out hitters. 
If you're relying solely on contact, and Dustin that's May doesn't. Not right now, he doesn't because he doesn't have the same mechanics. He's had two bad starts since coming off Tommy John, yeah, right? And they're both against a bad Padres team. The Dodgers would have gone six and zero against the Padres if Dustin May was even half himself, but instead they went four and two in those six games. I mean, they're bad, but their offense is fine. Okay. Not Juan Soto, who I'll get to in, get to him right now. He is in a four for 48 slump. Absolutely no power. Still sitting on three home runs as a Padre. Don't think he's had any against the Dodgers. I think in the most recent series against Los Angeles, he went like one for 11. Joe Musgrove's been calling Justin Turner, not a threat. Well, the real non-threat has been Juan Soto because the team that supposedly won the trade deadline has been the biggest disappointment in baseball. And it's not even close. They're 18 and 19 since that trade. And the big three has been the big one. Cause it's literally just been Manny Machado for them. Who cares? They're 22 games back. Why? Like who cares? I don't care about the Padres anymore. I just don't. They might not even make the playoffs. They're they're That's what, what two games ahead of the Brewers. Now one game ahead of the Brewers. Neither, neither of those teams wants to win right now. <laughs> Yeah, they've been they pretty traded, bad. They traded that weird trade, and both of their Rodgers and Hayter have been awful. But yeah, I, I'm just going to go back to Tyler Anderson. I mean, I agree with David. He's got to be the game three starter if Gonsolin isn't ready, but game four without a doubt. I mean, a 194 ERA over his last seven starts, and it's been again against good teams too. 15 and three, 262 ERA. I mean, you can't leave that out of the postseason rotation. There's just no way. No, there's no universe where he's not pitching in the first three games. Zero. Mookie Betts setting a Dodgers franchise leader, uh, franchise record right now with 34 leadoff home runs, surpassing Jock Peterson. That's impressive. I don't know why there's some fans out there who aren't sold on Mookie Betts being the team's leadoff hitter, but best leadoff hitter I've ever seen as a Dodger. People are still saying that? I don't think people are saying that anymore. (laughs) They're saying because of Mookie Betts' power, he needs to be hitting second or third to drive in more runs. Trey Turner is like leading baseball in RBIs. You don't need that when you have Turner and Freeman hitting behind him. It's it's ridiculous. So yeah, Trey Turner, 20 home runs himself, 20 steals, 96 RBIs. That's absolutely insane from a shortstop. Not even Corey Seager could put up those type of numbers. Wow. That's big of you to say. Well, I'm let that sink in for a second. Corey Seager got 325 million. No doubt in my mind, Trey Turner won't get under 300 million. It's just, there's just no way. Lindor set the market. Trey Turner's been the best shortstop since 2019, I could argue. So he's got to be paid. We'll Will talk about, do- I, I want to talk about this postseason lineup. That's what I want to talk about. Let's do it. What are your thoughts, David? Okay. So we know how the top, you know, six is going to go. It's going to be Betts, uh, Freeman, Turner, Smith, Turner, and Muncie. In some order, obviously. Turner, Muncie might be flipped, but those are those are the top six. That's that's locked in there. So seven, eight, nine. We don't really know how it's going to be. Is Gavin Lux? I'm going to assume is in there. If he's if he's healthy, he's in there. Second baseman. So you got center and you got left and you got Cody Bellinger, Trace Thompson, Chris Taylor. And Joey Gallo, I guess. So for me, I'm going right now, Cody Bellinger in center and Trace Thompson in left. I don't think you can keep Trace Thompson out of this lineup. Uh, I think Cody Bellinger has earned the right to play in the postseason. Uh, I think if it's an AJ Pollock situation, when you get there, a 20, uh, 2020 or 29, uh, 2021, maybe. No, no, no. Pollock killed it last year. It must've been 2020 when they had the bench Pollock uh, after like an 0 for 13 with 12 strikeouts or something. Yeah, if we get to that, if we get to that point, then, then it's time to bench Bellinger. But I think Bellinger has earned the right to start out in center field and center, uh, in the playoffs. Uh, the defense speaks for itself and he's, he's been slightly better recently. So that is, that is my lineup. I mean, if it's so game- wait, so wait, Chris Taylor's not on there. Correct. Or is okay. If it's game one and it's a right-handed starter, Let's just say it's Jacob DeGrom, I guess. We can go with Cody Bellinger because of the platoon advantage. Not feeling good about it. And frankly, he had two good games. Uh, the last one against the Padres and the first one against Arizona, I believe. 
but he's still got a 260 on base for the season. He's still hitting 200. He's there's four. no there's no point to look at season stats anymore. This is at this point it's a it's a what have you done lately type situation. Well, I'll get in there right now. Four for his last 25 with zero home runs versus Chris Taylor, who's eight for his last 25. He had a home run off Joe Musgrove. He's looking more like himself at the plate as of late. His batting average is creeping up to 227, striking out less. So I don't really know who to go with at this point. I guess that's why it's great. There's still about three weeks to play it out. But for every big moment that Cody Bellinger has had in the postseason, you can counter that with Chris Taylor. And you look at their postseason stats, a 259, 842 OPS, nine home runs for CT3 versus 213 batting average. 671 OPS, nine home runs for Cody Bellinger. I said it last season, you can't count out Chris Taylor when the moment is at its peak. And like I said, game one, fine. We can go with Bellinger. I'm not going to cry about it, but I think Chris Taylor has earned it even more than Bellinger at this point. And he is signed on for three more years as opposed to Bellinger who could be in his last season with the Dodgers. So I, I don't know where to go. You're also going, me, with Tom, you're going with Thompson, just to clarify. At, at this point, he's earned Thompson's it. a lock for me, okay. too. He has to be. He, he's he's hit righties better than he's hit lefties. Um, but he's but he's hitting everyone right now. Um, I think that you got to go strict platoon with with Bellinger because as good of a center field as, as Bellinger plays, and he does play elite defense in center field, I, I don't think you lose that much. With Trace Thompson in center field, he's looked pretty adequate out there and has done the job and, and looks kind of graceful doing it. So if there's a lefty on the mound, then I would put Bellinger on the bench and I would start Taylor. And I think that an outfield of Taylor, Thompson, and Betts is pretty damn good. Um, I don't think Joey Gallo is going to see the field much. Um, he's, you know, obviously has the potential to hit the ball 500 feet, but he's not been making a lot of contact with the baseball and you know, he, he hasn't been consistent and he's a huge strikeout threat. Now, granted, so is Chris Taylor, but you know what Chris Taylor can do in the postseason. and Joey Gallo. I mean, you, you know, sometimes it's just an automatic strikeout with him and it's just, it's not pretty. And even though he does walk quite a bit, he doesn't get on base that much. So he's going to, he's going to sit on the pine along with his buddy, Hans or Alberto both great guys. Um, they'll have a great time on the bench and, and be ready to, to come in uh, for defensive purposes. Yeah. Gallo will be the Edwin Rios of 2020. He might get one start here and there. Five home runs with the Dodgers, hit a 438 just the other night, dead center. So the power is absolutely there. And he's basically been the equivalent to what Cody Bellinger's been. It's just at this point, Bellinger's been a Dodger a lot longer, so there's more loyalty there. But well, I mean, he dead also even has at this postseason point. track record of success, you know, he doesn't. But neither did Eddie Rosario, and he went complete bonkers. I'm last saying season. Bellinger does. I I know, and I'm and I'm countering saying it doesn't always matter because there's been Eddie Rosarios who probably didn't play much in the postseason, well, and then they went off. The Travis Ishikawas of the world. Yeah. <laughs> God, <laughs> that disappeared. Daniel Murphy's. Oh, Daniel Murphy. God damn. He killed us. Good question here. Coming from chief joy, Seven Twenty. Who would you rather face in the NLDS, the New York Mets or the Atlanta Braves? That's a good question. I think we've had this kind of before, but things have shifted. So who do you guys got? Here, I literally here, go ahead, Jake. What I was going to say is, is that obviously the Mets have this the the scary one-two punch of DeGrom and Scherzer I mean that's what scares me the most their lineup though does not scare me as much as Atlanta's lineup does I think Atlanta top to bottom has a an unbelievable lineup they have Ronald Acuna Jr. back Ozzy Albies is coming back it looks like he was uh, I saw him you know hitting a walk-off home run I think in 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 triple a so their lineup is stacked and everyone is having a great season in their lineup. So I, and, and they've got great pitching. So I, I think in a short series, I would rather face the Mets than the Braves, but honestly, it's a toss up, but that's kind of where I'm leaning. So I literally wake up every morning and like, this is the first thing I think about. And I, <laughs> I, I literally can't decide one day. I'm like, you know what? 
I think the Mets. I, I really do think the Mets. I think the Grom, we've hit the Grom in the past. Uh, Scherzer might not even be healthy. And we, we've hit, we've also, you know, hit him in the past. And then I think about the Braves, Spencer Strider and Max Fried. And I think my answer is going to be the Mets as well. I, I, you know, I go back and forth, but let's say five out of the seven days of the week, I, my answer is the Mets. Uh, the Braves lineup, like Jake said, simply is way more powerful. Uh, they kind of had our number last year. It's a lot of the is same guys. What? A lot of the same guys? No. Is it more powerful? A hundred percent, bro. Acuna has been bad this season. Austin Riley is a problem. And yes. the rest of that lineup is, is, is legit. Dansby Swanson is having a career year. Harris. Uh, Albies is going to be back. Michael Harris, Vaughn Grisham, <laughs> if he keeps playing. Uh, their uh, catchers yeah. can hit home runs. Yeah, bunch of rookies. Uh, meanwhile, you got the Mets. You got Pete Alonzo, and you got Lindor, who's been all right. And you got Marte, who kills yeah. us. After yeah. that, it's not a lot. Jeff McNeil is a fantastic guys. Nimmo, utility Nimmo does player. give us some issues. Yeah, I'm, you know, Nimmo. I'm not losing sleep over Jeff McNeil. I'm sorry. I'm just not. Is he I just single me to death in the postseason. I no, see no. him as like <laughs> the next Daniel Murphy. I really do. Just a great scrappy hitter. Then all of a sudden hitting nukes. I, that's my worries. But to jump in here, I've been saying it all along. Give me the Braves because I think in a best of five, you don't want to face the New York Mets because Jacob DeGrom, Max Scherzer is a deadly one-two punch. And starting pitching is what wins. DeGrom shut us down earlier this season. I don't really agree with David. We might have gotten to DeGrom once or twice, but I remember in 2015, we had no answer for him. Max Fried, we've we've hit him around a few times. So 2015, what is that? Like one Tommy John surgery ago? Like two yeah. presidents ago? I mean, DeGrom wasn't even in his prime yet when he shut us down. He went Max on the- Fried, though. We have gotten to him. Yes, I agree with that. But Max Freed has absolutely owned us a lot. So and so has DeGrom but, and Scherzer. But, but DeGrom owns everyone. So yeah. it's not really saying much. <laughs> what? It's saying a lot. He's the best pitcher on the mound. I healthy. just said I don't want to face DeGrom. But, that, I know. but, the, but the Mets yes, lineup is not as the Mets lineup is not as potent. Well, we lost the, the Braves we lost lineup. The, is. We lost the season series to the Mets. We beat the Braves. And also, let's get into Kenley Jansen, who's been a complete disaster as of late. When you have a closer who's been shaky like Kimbrell, give me that over Edwin Diaz, who's been. I think the Edwin best Diaz is going to have an implosion in the playoffs. I've thought it all year. I don't know what it is. I just think it's going to happen. Well, I've seen it with Jansen a lot, so I have something to base it off of. Well, they, he might not even be the closer at, the, at this rate for them. Tyler Matzek has not the been the point same. is the point is, is that it it's going to suck who, uh, I mean, I, I, with either team it, in a short series. I mean, a short series is, is, is tough to begin with, and right? They but, don't have Freddie Freeman. Can't forget that, but facing, but honestly facing either the Mets or the Braves in a short series is, is really frightening. Either one. I don't, I don't want either. And I do think that someone like the Phillies could be a, a spoiler, but uh, my last point is I will be damned if Eddie Rosario repeats what he did a year ago. There's just no way that could happen. He has like a negative 1.7 war this season, batting like 200, four home runs. He was the reason the Braves beat us a year ago. Not Dansby Swanson, not Austin Riley, not Freddie Freeman, not even the starting pitching really, but freaking Eddie Rosario. And I will be damned if that happens again, because that was the biggest fluke of all time. More than the Giants winning 107 games, but fucking Eddie Rosario going into Ken Griffey Jr., Barry Bonds mode, and we having no answer to get this guy out whatsoever. Not gonna I agree, happen. but but Eddie Rosario is not even a starter for that team anymore. I you know, Michael Michael Harris and, and Vaughn Grisham are super high talented prospects who are both nearly hitting 300 or above 300. Both can hit for power. Both have speed. This Braves lineup is a problem. They got Darno and Contreras, who can both hit the ball out of the ballpark. Uh, they traded for Robbie Grossman, who's been okay, I think. Uh, it's it's a it's a one to eight lineup that you have to worry about. Where the Mets is a one to four, maybe four. So I agree. Overall, one through nine, the Braves have the deeper lineup, but I feel like a lot of fans are underestimating the Mets true depth in their lineup. I mean, you look at the infield, I would take Alonzo over Matt Olson. 
uh, second base. Albies hasn't really played all season, so I don't know what to expect from him. I'll take Jeff McNeil. Shortstop, Lindor, Swanson, I think that's a wash. And then third base, obviously, huge edge to Atlanta with Austin Riley. Catchers, I don't know what's going on with Travis Darnold. I still think he's one of the biggest flukes in baseball. And then you, you guys brought up Alcuna. Acuna, he's a fantastic hitter, but 13 home runs this season, 755 OPS. It's not been the same player ever since that knee injury. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I – think I might go with the Mets lineup too, because as great as Harrison um, Gr- Grism. Yeah. Von Grisham. Von, yeah. They have no posting experience, postseason experience. They're rookies. Mark Canna is sneaky underrated. Starling Marte is actually a, pit, a player I've seen kill us this season. And then pitching edge. I mean, DeGrom and Scherzer are about as seasoned as it gets versus Spencer Strider, who has yet to pitch in a postseason game. So who knows what happens with him? And they don't have Ian Anderson. He'll be out with an injury. And then Charlie Morton's old. So that's all I got on that. It's not th- going to be fun either way. Uh, the uh, I think it's a coin flip either way. Uh, I think they're both have pretty much the same uh, challenges. You got the top two in the rotation. And then you got a pretty top-heavy lineup. Uh, but the Braves having a bit of an advantage in the, in that regard. So... Either way, it's not going to be fun, and then probably you're going to have to play the the other one in the NLCS. It's looking like it. Although the Cardinals, I don't know if we can sleep on yeah, them. They, that's they, true, they, but they, I don't know if they got pitching to, to hold up. They might not, but when you got Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, and apparently Joe Montgomery, Yankees butchered that one big time. J-Mo? Adam Wainwright. He's, he's been a little – Montgomery's been – has been good, but it's been a little shaky too. So he doesn't, he doesn't scare me. Harrison it's, Bader hasn't even played well, for the Yankees. What the hell was that trade? It, yeah. I mean, it's not about the Cardinals threatening the Dodgers. It's more the Cardinals being in the NLCS is kind of more my point. Oh, I would love that. I'm, yeah. I'm a huge Cardinals fan in the NLDS. Yeah. Question coming from Shirtado741. How do you feel about the Dodgers calling up Bobby Miller in October. Well, pass it over to David because he's more uh, adamant on this one. I, I wouldn't say adamant. I would like to see it. Uh, he's obviously not going to be on the postseason roster at this point. Um, I, I would like to see it. I think I think it might happen, honestly. I think they, they might give him one start, uh, not only for his own experience, but just to give some of these guys in the rotation – an extra day off or, or skip through the return turn of the rotation. But I think uh, unless there's some string of injuries in the next three weeks, then you're not going to see him on the postseason roster, but I would like to see it uh, get him, get him one start. He's on the 40 man, right? No, he is. No, he's not. He's not. No. That's why he's not been called up. I thought they had to protect him. No, or he's, he's not he's there. Yeah. He's only... only been in like two years. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. No. So the answer is, not going to happen this season. First of all, he is not even postseason eligible because he wasn't added to the 40 man prior to August 31st, which was a deadline. Even if there's an injury that doesn't happen, that's the exception. The Dodgers would have okay. to rule out someone for the rest of the season. So I don't want to see that happen. Um, I think it's more likely you would see Michael Grove or even Ryan Pepio start or come out of the bullpen in the postseason. If things, post-season? Cat- if things catastrophically went wrong and all of a sudden, everyone's dropping like flies but i mean to answer the listener's question not gonna see bobby miller because they'd have to add him to the 40 man someone would then have to be dfa'd and i just don't think there's room i I really don't see who they could let go at this point but this is gonna piss david off but a friend of the show who's been on here when mookie Betts became a dodger um Longtime colleague as well to Roscoe 94. Will Danny Duffy ever pitch for the Dodgers? Come on, dude. We're, so, I feel like you made that question up just so you could say <laughs> Danny Duffy on this podcast. Did you feed him that question? Be honest. Oh, me? No, yeah. I, I don't, I don't rig anything. I'm not like the election. Okay. All right. Well, before we get completely off the rails, no is the answer. No, they already shut him down. There was, there was that glimmer of hope, that which is what Danny Duffy is good at. He's like, oh, he's, he's, he's throwing again. And then all of a sudden, it's like, nope, not responding well. 
No, he will never pitch for the Dodgers. He was never going to pitch for the Dodgers this year. It's a sad story. Would have liked to see it, I guess. But at this point, just stop. And that is the end of the Danny Danny Duffy discussion for this season on the incline. You guys get your words in. But until I see him on the field, this is over. I'm reinstituting the rule. And that includes listener questions. So if you're listening, no more Danny Duffy questions. He gets I don't, joy. Care. I don't care. He gets to join the great list of <laughs> That's a good answer. Jason Schmidt, Cole I Hamels, just said that. Yeah. guys that just didn't pitch for the Dodgers. I mean, I'll be honest. Hey, when they at said least Jason Schmidt pitched for the Dodgers, at least he t- took a step on the field. He did 10 yeah. times, I think. But, but at the price, I'd rather go with what happened with Duffy. Uh, but with that being said, when the Dodgers initially re-signed Duffy and they said he'd be coming back in June, Ugh. I thought, no chance in hell. Biggest lie on the planet. I they did, were saying that he yeah, was going to pitch of, for us last year. June of what year? They didn't specify what year. They said when they made the trade for him that there was a, sh- that there was a real chance of him pitching for the team last year. It's preposterous. He'll be throwing peanuts out next season. That's what he'll be doing at Dodger Stadium. Yeah, he's been useless. I mean, there's no other way I mean, to go sucks, about it. Because he seems like a cool guy and he's an LA guy. But I mean, we can't keep doing this. This is the definition of insanity. Yeah. Cole Hamels has a better shot at pitching for the Dodgers in the postseason than Danny Duffy at this point. Honestly, I think they're equal. Just to piss everyone off even more, G D Lou Hosh getting it on the phone on Twitter. If Bellinger struggles, continue into the postseason. Do they non-tender him? Another thing that we've <laughs> talked about before. I mean, the answer, the answer, whether you want to accept it or not, is if he sucks in the postseason, uh, he's not going to be a Dodger next season. There's just no way. Why are you, why would you pay another 18 million for a 200 hitter? Because the upside is astronomical. They're not cutting what upside? him. He has not been. He won an MVP player. three years ago. So has Christian Yelich. Do you think he's bouncing back? Uh, he could. Could from three, four years ago. That's a big if. I mean, at this point, we've seen more bad than good. So it's like hoping Santa Claus is a real thing. It's not. So it says the guy who thinks Danny Duffy's coming back. Look, I don't think they're he's not. They're back. not DFAing him. They're not. At the very oh. worst case scenario, they will find a trade partner for him and they will get something for him. But you're not just going to throw a 2019 MVP, a postseason clutch performer, and a gold glove defender in the trash for no reason for $18 million. You're already going to be over the uh, CBT line, most likely. This is this $18 million is nothing. It's peanuts in today's game if you're an organization like the Dodgers. There's this guy named James Outman who... I'm potential. not saying he's going to start every day. Well, then they, there's no way they bring him back because what's the point? I'm saying he's going to get the opportunity to start. If he gets beat out in spring training and in, in, in April, then then it might be it might be curtains for him. But he's going to get the opportunity. There really is the, the eighteen million dollars is nothing for this team. Just pay him. Just just get it done. It, the the it's a I think it's a. Uh, low risk, high reward move because it's it's a contract year, and we know players play well in contract years. So to me, I think it's a no brainer that they keep it. Yep. Then he should have been having the mentality that this was a contract year because he very well might not get the chance to prove it. I don't know. He's I mean, gonna get the chance to prove it. Seems like Dave Roberts is low on him. I don't think the organization has much faith in him at this point. Yeah, the best thing, know, but we don't know that. I mean, we, we, we can only see what Dave Roberts has done publicly. He's benched him a few times in his career. So you can go based off that, but I don't, there's no way to tell that the organization is low on him. They trot him out there every day because they're hoping to get something out of him. Cause they're they paying sh- him. He, the money. he should start every day until the rest of the season. They should give him as many at bats as possible right now to try to just ride it out. I agree. There's no downside to that. And they will, and they should, because the the other thing with Bellinger is he doesn't have an identity. He changes his batting stance every week. Yeah. And when you have a player that just doesn't know who they are at the plate, how can you really count on that? Why didn't he go back to the the 2021 postseason Bellinger approach at the plate? 
He just completely ditched it once this season began. It's in his own head, and uh, you know, last next year is going to be his last chance. I don't know with with Outman right there. You got Trace Thompson. Um, Chris Taylor obviously can play the outfield. It's going to be a competition for him. They might, might just be, might be good. They might just non tender him and bring him back on a cheaper one year. They're not. They're, just, they're not non tendering him. They're just not. We'll see. I, I I just don't see why they would throw out money. I mean, yeah, they have the resources, by, but why not use it towards someone that's actually going to produce? Well, he might produce. That's the whole point. There's tons okay. of upside there. You, I think also, you have a... also the the it's not like it's not like the Dodgers need Bellinger in the middle of that order. They have the lineup is so stacked that you can afford to stash him at the bottom. And guess what? Then if he does start to hit, then your bottom of the order is just as scary as the middle of it. I think this is who he is, and you have a better chance of running into Santa Claus at this point. He might need a change of scenery. All I got to do is go to the mall, Kevin. (laughs) (laughs) I like that one. I mean, I think that's pretty much covers most of the Dodger stuff. Got to get into these costumes, though. The annual tradition, one of my favorite days on the internet. Dress-up day for the Dodgers on getaway day. A lot of highlights. A lot of highlights. You guys can rank them and deeply analyze what went on. But we had Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman as the Tiger Woods and Steve Williams caddy tandem. Trey Turner living up to the Wolf of Wall Street going with Jordan Belfort. Fits the character. He looked awesome in that character. Yes. With the money, the money toss is perfect. Gonsolin and Vessia doing the Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. Perfect. Got Gallo, Bellinger, Andre Jackson, and Justin Turner as Chippendales, male stripper guys. Dustin May thinking outside the box. Going. With I love the- that Cody Bellinger thought that uh, Justin Turner wanted to go with Chippendale like the chipmunks. <laughs> that was what he originally thought. And then they're like, no, dude, the Chippendales dancers, bro. It's hilarious. Uh, Dustin May was a gingerbread man. He was literally him, his ginger self with bread tied to his body <laughs> so great julio urias like the animal he is on the mound was a squid game guard chris taylor gavin lux miguel vargas and then a couple other dudes i didn't recognize the coaches up. i think yeah or Who trainers it was like trainers coaches or something like that so you know every year i see people in the picture i'm like who the hell are these guys <laughs> I'm surprised. Uh, I'm surprised Kirsten didn't dress up. She dressed up. I think she dressed up last year. Didn't yeah, she? She, she wasn't, the Power she wasn't Ranger. there. I thought she was the pink Power Ranger. But this year she wasn't there. She was. Oh, she wasn't there. Oh, it was, it was Vasse. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. But um, yeah, so they were the Sandlot uh, five guys. And then Clayton Kershaw, Tyler Anderson, not a combo I expected, but Top Gun, Maverick, and Goose. Although I hope uh anderson's fate is a lot better than what happens to goose spoiler, <laughs> spoiler alert, alert. <laughs> and then yeah alberto is a, a power ranger I, I, I will say though that that chris taylor joining the sandlot crew having to shave his face he's actually started to hit better without facial hair so that's something to keep in mind but the the uh, the one i wanted to to highlight real quick and it's something that we kind of saw uh in the post-game champagne shower when they clinched the division which was Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman, another unlikely friendship duo in the Dodgers clubhouse. They are really tight and it shows and they, you know, are really close. And so them doing that picture together makes a lot of sense. And we talked about it, or I've talked about it before on this podcast about how Mookie Betts has learned a lot from Freddie Freeman and Trey Turner. And, you know, there were, there was that stretch in the beginning towards the beginning of the year where, you know, Mookie Betts was struggling and he wasn't, you know, hitting the cover off the ball. And then the three of them got together and told him to be more aggressive. And so he did and basically learned from them. And it's, it was an incredible uh, turnaround for Mookie Betts to go from kind of having an okay season to now being in the MVP conversation. No doubt. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And they're going to be teammates for at least another five years. So you did point out that 
Freddie Freeman has rejuvenated, reinvigorated Mookie's approach at the plate, and we've seen him be a lot more aggressive on first pitch and taking more initiative, tacking pitches in the zone. And obviously that's benefited with Mookie Betts being now a 34 home run hitter and counting. Um, and then Justin Turner, I feel like we already talked about him to kick off the show, but just to get back to it, I mean, he had another home run off Joe Musgrove. That's like three this season. He had a grand slam off Craig Stammen. So that's the Turner you want going into the postseason. I mean, the Dodgers have taken 12 of the 16 games they've played against the Padres this season. So just another bust in the rivalry campaign. Yeah, I like Dustin May's costume the most. That was my favorite. He's really good at this, by the way. Like we got robbed of him last year doing was, the costume. He was day. the uh, he was it, right? Yeah. yeah. He yeah. really get, he really and gets he into character. He like fully embraces his, you know himself and 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 gets into character there. Also, I love the I love the 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 fact that of what he went with because you know he just kind of strung some bread over his neck and became the gingerbread man. One of the easiest costumes to ditch once you get on the plane. You just take off the yeah. bread and you're in a t-shirt and you're chilling. Andrew Heaney was the Dr. Pepper guy. I forgot to mention that. He looked the part. It was yeah. great. He went he went kind of obscure and he, and it worked. Yeah. What the hell is a Dr. Pepper man? What kind of costume is that? You've not seen those commercials? No. It's, it's, they're pretty funny. I mean, is what are we going for? Niche here? Like, what the hell is very, that, man? Very niche. Very. Like, okay. Like, good job, I guess, question mark. I saw Kimbrell was an astronaut. Dr. Pepper is a top four soda, so he's repping okay <laughs> why didn't he just be a dr pepper can then why do you have to be like a very select that's, thing that's that boring. like two percent of the country this understands. is a weird thing for you to be angry about <laughs> muncie I mean, was a like, keg and it was not even memorable well, yeah i, mean, I, really, like, I would like was... to understand the costumes like i are we really am i gonna be a random commercial for halloween like is that what we decided on i mean i'm sure a lot of people dressed up as flow like that yeah. is what you landed on like of anything you could be you're like you know what? I'm going to be the Dr. Pepper guy from that one commercial. It's very weird. That's why good, Dustin May should start game four. It's good. It's a good commercial. I mean, when you're, when you're watching Dodger games, you can't skip the commercials. So I appreciate good commercial content. Well, keep in mind, I'm also watching on MLB TV. Uh, so I don't see the local commercials. I see the MLB TV commercials. Yeah. Not my problem. Well, I have to it's watch fine. Earl Hershiser dance every 15 minutes. <laughs> my, okay, can I just say something? My dad loves the Caposio ads. He loves watching the Caposio. He's like, oh my God, Caposio's back on because he loves oral dancing and his terrible acting. And it's just brilliant. Another thing I haven't seen. <laughs> it's actually Jack, pretty funny. We get a lot of Jack the Box commercials, Del Taco every now and then, um, the Caposio ad, uh, car commercials and... Oh, Dr. The, Carl, the Carl's Jr. cheesy anchorman thing. Ugh, it's terrible. <laughs> Hate that guy. Anyway. Feel really left out right now. Yeah. Off day coming up for the Dodgers. Then they play the Giants. We got the probables of Dustin May against Logan Webb. So I'm curious I'll be to at see that game. That Julio Urias. With your buddy Logan Webb, huh? Yeah, he better, he's, he's going to pitch knowing I'm in the stands. Julio Urias against a to be announced and Andrew Heaney against Alex Cobb. The Dodgers are 12 and four against the giants this season. Unlike last season where it was neck and neck, they flipped the script, not even close for the most part. So I'm just thankful the Dodgers are taking care of business against all the NL West this season because they've really blown out all the competition. Yeah. It just, it, you know, obviously it didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but, get, but to, uh, to get walked off in that fashion uh, on a, on a, you know, kind of getaway travel slash off day is uh, kind of a bad taste in your mouth, given the fact of who blew the save, Craig Kimbrell. So, um, but yeah, I mean, overall, the Dodgers have just been absolutely tearing it up and and the NOS has been no match for them at, at any point, really. I got a real quick idiot of the week. Uh, it is Giants relief pitcher, Zach Littell. Oh, this is uh, great. I don't know if you saw, if you didn't see this, what happened is, he basically came in, gave up a couple runs, had a couple runners on base. Gabe Kapler came out to get him. And uh, when he handed Kapler the ball back, he turned around and had some words for Kapler. And if you watch the video, Kapler like basically was like, what the fuck are he you was talking dumbfounded. about? Uh, went back when Kapler got back to the dugout. He, he told him to get back in the tunnel. 
uh, get down in the tunnel. So they obviously had a, had a conversation. And the next day, Zach Littell got sent down to AAA. So my take on this is your ERA is north of 450. You just gave up two runs and you have two, uh, two runners on base. What the hell are you mad about? If you're mad about coming out of the game, pitch better. It's that simple. Like, who are you showing? Like, the fact that I have to defend Gabe Kapler right now is preposterous. Uh, but Gabe Kapler was 100% in the right. I'm glad they sent that guy down to AAA. Frankly, he didn't even belong in the majors. I said countless times that when Zach Littell is in the game against us, I feel like we are going to score runs. Uh, what, what are you mad about, bro? You just, you just smoked dick on the, on, the, on the field. You gave up two runs. You got two runners on, and now you're yelling at your manager for taking you out? Come on. Did, did they ever disclose what was said no, and when he was will. walking off the mound? They never yeah. will. Yeah, and also for, for a team that's not going to make the playoffs, it just the whole, the whole situation was just bizarre. You have called it, David, numerous times about Littell being the guy they can beat, so. He's the Craig Stammen of the Giants. I love me some Craig who Stammen. Was our, who, was our, who was the other guy we compared Craig Stammen to, or was it me? Who did I say it was? Forget, forget even what team it was. Do Mark you remember Melanson? what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> um. Oh, it was it was uh, Rogers, Taylor, uh, the Giants, Rogers. Which twin? The, I mean, the I, Giants one. The Giants one. Yeah. I feel like Dominic Leone like was someone Tyler. the Dodgers destroyed till he got. I feel like of the three, and Tim he Hill shut us down the Tim most. Hill. I love Tim Hill. Kevin Kevin hates Tim Hill. Yeah. The worst. Why we we crush him? He just Not doesn't always. like him. Seeger crushed him. I don't think they've really got into Tim Hill since. Um, and then we yes. should do we should do a a thing of our our favorite relievers to face. Top yeah, that'd five. be a good one. Yeah. Scott Alexander's now on the Giants. That was painful. He's like their watch. he's like their closer now. I love that he came and just shut us down. Just absolutely nails. I have a out of left field to cover real quick. Um, go for it i have beef with movie theaters because like the anaheim angels they have gone downhill tremendously (laughs) they're they're archaic at this point let me start with tickets because if you don't get them online now you got to go to like the concession stand to get your ticket so even if you don't want food you got to wait in that line and that's annoying when has that ever not been a thing this is not a new development you used to go to the ticket booth and there was like a pers- people there. You would. They still have that. Not really anymore, from what I've seen. They're cutting jobs. Okay, but like but, you buy your tickets online. But go ahead. I'm, I'll, I'll. And then start. you have to pay the stupid fee. But that's another dilemma. Popcorn, besides besides it being overpriced, when they serve you lukewarm or even cold popcorn, that should be a felony right there. <laughs> How do they let that slide? If I was working the popcorn stand, I would be monitoring that shit every 20 minutes because that is my due diligence right here. The customer. Yeah, you're, you're, you're trying to win employee of the month at the movie yeah, theater. Yeah, I mean, come on. What are they paying you? $15 <laughs> an hour and you're going to get on these people? Literally, your only job is to serve popcorn. And if you can't even do that right. <laughs> Make it hot, damn it. Make it hot. Doing? That's like going to in and out and getting lukewarm fries as well. It's the same thing. You are doing a service felony when you get popcorn that's below uh below room temperature i guess ruins your experience right there and not, besides the point all the rest of the food is pretty shitty too like why aren't we opening our game here like why is it this awful pizza and hot dogs and get a cook get a but cook kevin what a are cook? you talking about <laughs> They have what do you expect when you get now. what do you expect and you go to the theater? Like, what are you expecting? I mean, you go to Dodger Stadium and they got or any MLB ballpark, they got hot food. That's yeah, but the problem TV. is is that nobody's going to the theaters anymore. So they're losing employees. They got to jack up the prices, and you're not gonna get a fucking gourmet hot dog. At yeah, the, I mean, I feel theater. like a lot of this is on your expectations here. Like it I used, get your displeasure, but in, your expectations are too high here. Lower the bar. Well, the bar is very low now. And I think that's why no one wants to go to the movie theater because it's not the same experience. Then you got the previews. It used to be like three movie previews tops before the movie started. Now it's a 20 to 25 minute extravaganza. And I think David pointed it out two weeks yes. ago. 
start the give you a later show time or something i don't want to sit here for a half hour watching previews for movies that i'm not going to go back to the theater to see i here's I, here's my here's my issue with the previews thing because um the the issue is is that you get your you, you get your popcorn you get your drink or whatever yeah. you're eating it you're <laughs> drinking gone. it and then and then you're like it's gone and then you're like oh shit i gotta go to the bathroom and you're like trying to calculate like how much longer the Review. We got another one. Can I run out? Like, yeah, it's it, it, it's a mess. So, I think you need to temper your expectations. Well, I I'm think not, you got to realize. Not done here. Okay, carry on. Sticky floors is absolutely <laughs> disgusting. How many times have you been to a movie theater and you put your feet down and the floor is straight up sticky? It might be nastier than a toilet seat because come on, I don't know what's going on there. They obviously don't mop it up. <laughs> the floors at movie theaters. This is ridiculous. I have to be one of the grossest I'm loving things. this. Keep going. Kevin's on fire. Right. Keep going. Another thing that I have no idea of why it was invented <laughs> in the first list, place. Bro. The first three rows. And then you got like the elevated seats that go up kind of diagonal. What is the point of the first three rows? That is straight up <laughs> terrorism right there. Yeah, no, it's those are awful seats. You, no you one could straight up. If you choose to sit there and like you have a you you have a choice to sit in the elevated seats, but you choose to sit in the first three rows, you're a serial, serial killer. Yeah, I, I was just you're not you're, there to watch the movie. There, you're there for other reasons. I was just gonna say you're insane, but yeah, we can go down that road as well, but. Why don't they get rid of those? Because again, what's the point? Um, and then well, my last little kids. Oh, you're not done. My last beef. Ice and drinks is literally the Joey Gallo of um, I, or of drinks, I guess you could say, because it's so hit or miss. If if the concession stand worker fills your cup up with ice and it's big ice cubes, you're gonna get no drink. But you also kind of need to be dependent on ice because you want your drink to be cold. So I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but it, if they put too much damn ice in your drink, you're not getting the maximum liquid. Okay, so a lot of these things can be addressed by just simply opening your mouth. So you can be like, low ice, is this popcorn hot? What time does the movie start? Should I buy tickets online? Yes. And am I going to experience sticky floors? Maybe I won't wear my nice shoes. Don't sit in the first row. A lot of this can be can be dealt with, you know. For the pre I'm with you on the previews, but I plan like if I go to an eight thirty movie, I know the movie's not starting till at least eight forty, so I won't get there till eight thirty, you know. It's a good point. I can't I can't argue there, but at the same time, I want to be there on time. I'm a very punctual person. Being late to things gives me anxiety, so. I kind of have a, I have a mental health. I'm with you on crisis. that. I hate, I hate being late. That's the worst feeling in the world. It's the worst. That's all I got here. Um, anything else or final thoughts you guys want to cover real quick? No, I mean, I know that we're going to see Gavin Lux soon enough because he's, he's coming back from the injury, but it just kind of disappointed me that they didn't put him on the IL so that we could have seen guys like Outman and even Edwin Rios, poor Edwin Rios. He's back and healthy and he's, he's not going to get a shot to be on this postseason roster if there's not a, you know, a huge injury, which hopefully there isn't, but yeah, I just, I just feel like uh, I would have loved to see Outman come up, come up again because um, I know it's a small sample size, but you know, Vargas just, hasn't really been hitting the ball that well. And I just would have liked to have seen uh, Altman get some at bats. I, my final thought is, is something I wanted to talk about earlier, but we got sidetracked. It's Dave Roberts needs to do a good job of load management in these next three weeks. I don't want to see a reliever for the next 10 days, pitch on a back to back. I want to see at least, I want to see Hanser Alberto pretty much starting every single game because that means someone else is not starting every single game. I want to see rotating days off for a lot of these guys, Turner, Muncy, Turner, uh, Freeman, Mookie, Smith especially, get the load off Smith. Uh, you, they, I want they've, to been see, starting, they've been starting Barnes at catcher a lot. I want to see that pretty I want to see Barnes and Smith pretty much alternate behind the plate. I don't want to see Smith catching back-to-back -back days. And that's what worries me about Dave Roberts is because he has not traditionally been very good at load management. Uh, there's a fine line between keeping these guys, uh, you know, in season and competing, 
But with this much of a, of a lead, obviously the division's clinched, but a lead in the uh, uh, first seed, I want to see Roberts, especially over the next seven to nine days, uh, give a lot of these guys days off. You can ramp it back up towards the last two weeks of the season. But over the next week, I want to see nobody playing every day. I'm with you. Tough one. Do not want these guys to lose their rhythm because if they get too comfortable, they also have four or five days off between the wild card round and the NLDS. So, which is why they'll, which is why that that's what David was saying is like you, you, you ramp it up right and, in your, you know, if you, even if you don't, even if you start, maybe take them out in the fifth inning, that kind of stuff. That's yeah, yeah exactly. The whole cold to hot thing is how guys get hurt. I think if they're in their routine, you don't really want to break it. Yeah. Give Freddie a, a game off once a week, but He's shown no signs of slowing down. So why I am I just can't stomach get... another something that happened with Muncie last year? I can't take it. Yeah, well, that was a nightmare. That was a freak injury. And well, those happen. That could happen at any given point. But I mean, it's, it, it is what it is. I mean, 2018, the Dodgers had to play a game 163. They made the World Series. So I, I rest is overrated, in my opinion. It's it's the load management is important, but don't get too comfortable here or else we're going to get another 2019 where they get blindsided by a nationals team. It's yeah. not, it's less about, it's less about um, load management and it's more about avoiding injuries. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. it's not about like, Oh, they need breaks. They don't need breaks. They could play the rest of the season. They could play every single game for the rest of the season and be fine in the playoffs, but it's about trying to limit the amount of time that they are exposed to potentially getting injured. Exactly. Well, you got to have nine guys play the, or eight guys play the field and someone pitch. So don't Andre know. What to Alberto, tell you. lace them up. Yeah. Get out there, pal. Right. He's going to still be playing first a lot. So I don't know what to tell you. You can't DH them all and you can't put them in bubble wrap. Injuries happen. I don't think you should let what happened last season traumatize you forever. It, because it has and it will. It almost happened to Freeman the other game. And that was kind of scary. For some. Thankfully, Freeman did not get involved, but we don't have to go down there. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, just back to Jake's thing about Lux. Timing would have made sense a week ago, but at the same time, I kind of get what Dave was doing because he wanted to guarantee starts for Gallo, Bellinger, Taylor, get them right. It's more about them and less about Outman, I guess, trying to get at bats, squeeze them in there. Miguel Vargas, yeah, that's disappointing. Um He'll be better next season. I think Edwin Rios probably should have had his at-bats. I don't quite understand why they just are leaving him off completely out for dead because he was pretty good when healthy. My only head scratcher there is why are we just ditching Rios like he's – I don't know. I don't, I don't get that. Yeah, I don't either. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Incline Dodgers podcast this week. Give us a five-star rating wherever you download your podcast subscribe follow us on twitter our handles are in the description below and your daughters are 98 and 44 going to san francisco nos champions baby nine out of ten years go dodgers